Hey YouTubers, this is Lonnie Clark again, Nuts for Art, and I'm going to read a little bit from our book, Population Control Through Nuclear Pollution by Goffman and Tamplin. We're almost done. We've only got like 20 pages left. It's kind of been an interesting journey. I guess it's taken me quite a while to get through this. I want to thank everybody for sticking with me, and tonight I was on uh, Dana's post. Actually, to be honest, it was really great to connect with everybody through the internet. Um, I guess we're a small group of people who actually are paying attention, who have the courage enough to face it. So I guess we all have our courage feet on already. So I'm going to keep reading. I'm going to do a separate post, but I want to talk about this painting here. Uh, this is by my friend Ricardo de Napoli. He was trained in Argentina. He's an Argentinian artist. He moved here to the United States and um, he painted this because I kind of harassed him. Like, why aren't you doing some artwork on Fukushima? And he came up with this and uh, he gave it to me as to try to sell to help with the Post Ignorance Project. So, um, I have a price of $1,000 on it. That's what I think it's worth. If somebody else wants to make a better offer, maybe a little bit lower, I won't take less than $500 for it. But if you want to contribute to the Post Ignorance Project, you know, Kevin's going to Europe and we really need funds, actually. And I think it's a great idea that he's going. I don't know. Honestly, this it's like a crapshoot. How effective is it? Well, what we know is that the fucking nuclear, anti-nuclear people have been fucking zero effective because they're still fucking drowning us in bullshit. So I support everything that Kevin does. And, you know, like Dana, I and, you know, I've given money to Dana. I think he's great. And I personally am willing to use my my savings and my personal funds to help support this cause. Um, so anyways, I'm going to get to reading, but if anybody wants to purchase this painting, it, the my my fee my starting bid is a thousand bucks, but if someone wants to send me an email and say, "Hey, uh, I'll give you $500 for it," I'd probably let it go for 500 bucks. So uh, I think it's an awesome painting. There's another one that I'm going to go pick up. He's done that. Uh, maybe you've seen it on my Facebook page with the mom and her child. And it is fucking awesome. It's actually really awesome. This was his own creation, his own idea. And I think, frankly, it is It's one of the best paintings I've seen. I, if somebody was to buy it for $1,000 or $2,000, I would be heartbroken to let it go, but I will let it go. So anyways, it's three minutes in. Let me get to the new subtitle. We are on page 218. Uh, some questions for the signers of the Sagan letter. Okay, so I have to read the last two sentences because otherwise this won't make sense because you might not remember what it says. We may translate the Sagan letter above as follows. The people who populated the various commissions and groups who promulgated the various standards, now under total challenge, were sincere, hard-working, dedicated scholars who did the best they could." Unquote. Some questions for the signers of the Sagan letter. Why argue with that? Let us assume the motivation was the highest, the dedication supreme. But let us indeed ask questions about a sense of moral responsibility concerning a non-intended but nevertheless persuasive, arrogant psychology that characterizes scientists. We must try to understand how 29 scientists justify a set of standards promulgated 10 years before the most important questions and answers related to those standards were even known. How did these 29 scientists answer Professor McMahon's correct statement in 1969 that we don't even now have the necessary information to decide acceptable radiation doses, either for individuals or populations? How did these 29 scientists say not only were the obvious they, excuse me, how did these 29 scientists say not only were the 29 obviously 
unjustified standards acceptable in 1960, but they are even acceptable now in the face of devastating evidence to the contrary. Well, that's exactly the question we posed to Catherine Higley, isn't it? Ken Busler. What's that other rat's name? Uh, Jay Cullen. What sort of answer from 29 scientists to a set of scientific presentations of cancer and leukemia risk 10 to 20 times higher than previous estimates? Is, is it to retreat from presenting a single item of evidence in refutation and to resort to applying the balm of empty reassurance to a troubled congressman's head? That's exactly what these motherfuckers did. 11,000 scientists joined Linus Pauling in his concern over fallout levels of radiation, one twentieth of those current concern for the peaceful atom. 11,000 scientists throughout the world. And since then, the evidence has grown even more disturbing. Yet 29 scientists, almost all within or supported by the AEC, blithely reassure Congress about radiation exposures 20 times as high. And they arrogate to themselves the appellation of a, quote, consensus of informed opinion, unquote. This band of 29 scientists apparently consider the vast bulk of biological community of scientists either uninformed, unconcerned, or incompetent. Or can it be that some dynamic, unappreciated, by anyone involved, excuse me, let me start that again. Or can it be that some dynamic, unappreciated, by anyone involved, would account for a group of primarily atomic energy supported scientists having difficulty seeing the perils of a byproducts hazard of the technology for which they held such high hopes, no matter how the facts indicate such hopes to have been optimistic and unjustified. Surely the reader can wonder about this problem. You know, the way this guy writes, he definitely writes like a scientist. He, like, talks himself. He says a whole lot of words to say a little bit of shit. And how shall the 29 scientists explain the justification for the standards they so warmly appreciated as being, quote, consistent with the orderly development of atomic energy? Cons unquote. Concern over pricing society out of business? Yes. Concern over orderly development of atomic energy? Yes. Concern over the welfare of the human species? Question mark, question mark, question mark. New subtitle, Totalitarianism in Science, which frankly has bled into totalitarianism in society. That was my little two bits. The title, the subtitle is Totalitarianism in Science. Defensiveness about one's children is a common human trait. And, certain atomic ener and certainly, atomic energy can be regarded as the child of many of the current inbred generation of atomic scientists. Ha <laughs> ha, I think you hit on something here. The outmoded safe radiation standards are the particular child of, a, of the biomedical segment of the atomic energy community of scientists and technologists. Hopelessly trapped by a dynamic which breeds a feeling of omnipotence and without evidence to support their position, defensiveness is not unexpected. It is simply a human foible, once more held up for all to see. Were the defensiveness simply to serve as a Holyfield, Holyfield bomb, Holyfield is, remember, the senator, one would be unalarmed, amused, and even tolerant. But far di deeper issues are at stake. Issues that so transcend atomic energy that they must be appreciated by all members of society for their very life and freedom from totalitarian, authoritarian domination are the real issue. 
And this, my friend, is what we fucking lost in the journey. This is why we have the fucking Unpatriot Act, why we have the bullshit going on today, and why we have all the other, like, conspiracy bullshit about Jade Helm and the chemtrails. I mean, who the fuck knows what's real and what's not real? It's fucking Big Brother on Balco. BBB. I guess that's the new BBB. Big Brother on Balco. <laughs> Anyways, back to John Goffman and Arthur Tamplin. The potentiates of old had and the dictators of today have a simple answer for dissident opinion. Quote, off with their heads, unquote. Or as Obama would say, off to prison. <clears throat> Among so-called civilized men dealing with important scientific issues, technological issues, decisions to go forward industrially, or matters of safeguarding the public health, the vast majority of people in a democracy such as ours would assume that reason must operate. But the day of Salome is over. And for students of the environmental crisis, in particular, those who really would hope to preserve a livable world for humans and other creatures. The realization that totalitarianism is rampant in scientific technological matters should send a sharp chill through their inner selves. For it is this phenomenon, more than any other, which will block and possibly destroy their most valiant efforts to make a survivable planet in all its splendor and beauty. Is totalitarianism rampant in science and technology? Look at the evidence using atomic energy as a shining example. As one of the major charges by the U.S. Congress, the Atomic Energy Commission is obliged to promote the peaceful uses of the atomic atom while giving prime consideration to the health and safety of the public in doing so. The Public Relations Department of AEC, expending unknown but undoubtedly large sums of taxpayer dollars, carefully and reassuredly and repeatedly reassure the public of its noble actions and intentions to give its heart and soul to the task of protecting the public health. The real problem we face is to find that heart and to examine that will-o'-the-wisp soul, assuming generously either exists. And to the people listening to this, thank you for listening. I know that I have not been the best reader, and I apologize. I haven't actually improved that much, but I'm going to plug on the protection of the public health means the examination of the crucial issues in the development of the uses of atomic energy. And the most important issue is the impact of any and all programs and activities of the AEC upon the health and welfare of the present and future generations of humans and the ecosystem of life which supports human existence. For no glorious applications of atomic energy or any technology will be a blessing to a non-existent life. Hello? We have explained how a dual charge of seeking out and developing atomic exploitation and protection of the welfare of the people leads to a hopeless impasse. Long ago, the Atomic Energy Commission should have forthrightly come to the Congress with a frank and honest admission that the two charges were clearly incompatible with each other and that the AEC should have requested it to be relieved of one or other of these two functions. Certainly, this would not have been regarded as a manifestation of inadequacy or of weakness or of lack of ability. The AEC could thereby have gained the confidence and respect of the, of the Congress and the public for a recognition of how important tasks are and are not to be done. But the AEC didn't do this. In 1963, <clears throat> after a long history of loss of public confidence in its health and safety pronouncements, the AEC felt it had to try to 
do something to restore some semblance of public confidence in its credibility. Even that late, it is clear that the only real answer for the AEC would have properly been to request the Congress to relieve it of all responsibility for any matters relating to public health and safety. A simple admission of total failure in this field would have earned respect and at least confidence in its sincerity. No one expects necessarily that the plumber will be a good pianist. Why should conceivably, why should they conceivably expect the promoter of sales wares to be the public health protector? But pride and position are, of course, strange and fascinating foibles to observe and supremely dangerous. I think I'll stop there. The subtitle now that we're coming on to is AEC is 18 years late with biomedical program. Wow. Well, I guess we've all learned, you know, we're living, we're living with their lack of integrity. So I'm going to keep on you guys and I really appreciate your, uh, continued support and thanks to everybody who was on Dana's feed tonight who was really sweet to me telling me that I'm doing a good job and that you think it's really important and I it makes me laugh because there's like 25 people who watch my news feed <laughs> except for the NSA they put me up at 301 <laughs> or 258 I don't actually believe that 258 people are watching my news feed or listening to this boring blah 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 but I really appreciate everyone, and I'm glad that we got to read this book together. And uh, it's kind of awesome because it re brings us back to being humans together. And I think that's, we're going to have to really stick together. Obviously, we have our courage feet on. Uh, so now we just have to stand firm and refuse to stop. And that's what I'm going to do. So... If anyone wants this painting, please email me at nutsforart at gmail. And uh, the price is pretty firm at $500. I would like to get $1,000 for it, but it's an original painting. It's really awesome. There is going to be another one I'm going to be picking up. Um, I don't think I'll have time to pick it up until when term ends in a couple weeks. So, But anyways, ciao, you guys. Put your courage feet on. Let's be brave and let's edify each other and lift each other up. And let's lift up humanity out of the, I don't know, out of the bathtub. They were trying to drown the baby in the bathtub and I fucking refused to be drowned. So, <laughs> ciao.